But first, earlier this week, Jacksonville Sheriff T.K. Waters said a new health care provider at the Duval County Jail has been selected after reporting from the tributary showed an increase in inmates' deaths under the former uh, provider, Armor Correctional Health Services. Nicole Manna of the Tributary is here now for a closer look. And before we dive in, I should disclose that I am a member of the Tributary Board. I don't have anything to do with their reporting. I just support the organization. Listen, if you want to join the conversation, you can call us at 549-2937, tweet us at FCC on air, email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org, or message us at on first, excuse me, or message us on Facebook. All right. So, Nicole, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I am excellent. So I read your report and I b- before we dive into that, I want to rewind and go back a little bit. Um, so when did the jail health care system become privatized? So that became privatized in October of 2017. They moved from handling their health care in-house. In October of 2017, they signed the contract with Armor and then they re-signed the contract for another five years in November of last year. <laughs> How much are we talking about? What, like, like, how big are these contracts? The last contract that was signed in um, November was $98 million. $98 million. So we're talking about a, a, a big chunk of money. Yes. <laughs> um, and my understanding is that switching from um, the jail handling, the, the Duval County basically handling the health care of inmates to privatization saved the city like seven, what was it, 700000 something like that? That's my understanding as well, that there was a significant amount of money saved by right. doing that. So this is about partially, I guess, about cost savings for the taxpayers, at least in the eyes of the people who made that change. Yes. So talk to me about Armour. Like what happened under their tenure at the in the jail? So this is all based on records that we actually obtained from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office um, from 2012 to 2017. There were about four deaths per year in the jail. Um, when Armour took over in 2017, from 2017 um, to now, there's been about 13 deaths in the jail per year. Um, so that death rate tripled under Armour. Yeah, that's a significant increase. Yes. Um, in the reporting, uh, I was reading that one of the big, for lack of better terms, uh, disconnect was that if someone gets arrested, they uh, a lot of times they would bring their medications with them, or if they didn't have their medications, they would request their medications and Armour didn't provide it. Yeah. So what's supposed to happen is if you're arrested, you go in, you have a healthcare assessment. And at that point, you're able to say, these are the prescriptions that I take. Um, For example, with Dexter Berry, the man who died in November um, after he didn't get his anti-rejection medications for his heart, um, the jail or armor did call his pharmacy and they did confirm the prescriptions that he's taking. They got all of them other than the anti-rejection medications. Um, armor said that they had ordered those medications, but they didn't get them before he was released. Um, I talked to another man, Carl Rainbolt. Um, he was arrested um, within the last few months. And um, that officer, he said, did bag up his medications and took them to the jail with him. He was in the jail um, for about eight days and didn't get any of his um, like pill medications. Um, did start getting his insulin shots, but it wasn't until about four days after his arrest. And that could have a, a really um, detrimental effect on your health uh, for him specifically, not like not getting your insulin shots. I mean, that long, long problems can come out of like not getting it right then. Of course. I um, have talked to Carl. I've talked to his daughter, Kristen, and Kristen said this is not the dad that I had before he was arrested. Um, He's now using a walker because he's not as strong when he walks. Um, She said, you know, before he was arrested, he was doing crosswords. He was, you know, he's 77 years old, but he was (laughs) he didn't mentally seem 77 years old is how she put it. Um, And since then, you know, his health mentally, physically has just deteriorated um, because he wasn't getting the care in the jail that he was getting outside of it. So after your report came out, uh, what were the moves that uh, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office took? Right. So we found out um, the day that the report came out, I found out Tuesday morning um, that the jail was going to end their contract with Armour and they were going to sign with another privatized healthcare company called NAFCARE. Um, And they made that announcement Tuesday evening, confirmed that that contract was signed on Monday. Um, We have that contract, so I've been spending time uh, reading through it and have not gotten all the way through. Um, But NAFCARE is very similar to Armour. It's another privatized um, company. 
It's another um, five-year contract. It's more expensive. It's $110 million. Um, The sheriff didn't say this at the press conference, um, but a chief of his told me um, that this comes with more staff, um, which I'm assuming is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But NAFCARE, like Armour, has been sued hundreds of times. Um, They have a similar history to Armour. Um, And um, a story came out that a man who was held in a jail in Atlanta um, actually died under NAFCARE's um, care due to being eaten alive by bedbugs, according to reporting in Georgia. That just sounds like something out of a horror movie. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. And and it's scary to think that this provider allowed that to happen to somebody. And now that same provider is taking over the Duval County Jail. Right. So um, Sheriff Waters was actually asked about that during the Tuesday press conference. Um, He, another reporter, brought up that case and said, does this concern you? Um, And he his exact quote was, I wouldn't have done it if I had that kind of concern. I tell you this, you could look at any medical facility in North Florida or throughout the state of Florida and they all have issues. They've all had lawsuits. They've all had those things. But at some point you have to look through it very carefully and make sure that you're making the right decision. I think we did. That sounds to me like like he is saying that there is no other solution and losing these lives are acceptable because there's no other solution. But yet we know that earlier the Duval County Health Department handled the uh, handled the, the medical care at the jail and we didn't have this type of problem. It was just more expensive. Right. And so the health care at some point, the health care department at one point handled um, the health care at the jail. At another point, JSO did it in-house. Um, and that is when we saw the, the lowest level of deaths. And we're going to go to the phone. We've got Sue in Mandarin. Sue, how are you doing this morning? I'm good, thank you. Good. Uh, I'm, my concern is in many years ago, as I said, I did some uh, shift work at the jail and, and intake. I'm a nurse. And people have to be screened, and they have to meet with somebody who looks at them, talks to them, asks them about their medications to see uh, what they need. And there is no excuse for not getting insulin or any kind of a critical med like those heart meds that the gentleman did not get, his his anti-rejection meds. Somebody, a professional person, has to do that if it's being... If it has been over the past downgraded to a paraprofessional or somebody else, it it brings in a problem. They cannot be given their own medications that they bring with them. You can't allow meds to come in from the outside. That's understandable. They have to be ordered from a pharmacy and be the correct meds. So that's my concern. Thank you, Sue. I think, you know, when we're talking about privatizing healthcare uh, in the jail specifically. Uh, privatizing healthcare is really about, you know, let's just be honest, it's about making money. Like it's a for-profit business. And so they're in business to make money. Um, and if you're in business to make money, the first thing that you begin to look at are what are your expenses? And I would imagine that a lot of those expenses come down to personnel, because uh, usually personnel in any business is your highest expense. Personnel, um, and then a, a lot of other cost-cutting measures. But I'm just wondering, um, in in the reporting, did you find that like armor was understaffed? Um, so Sue brought up a, a great question about the 14 day screenings. Um, you you are supposed to be going through health screenings, and then mm-hmm. you have to have one within 14 days. And we had found um, during one of the last inspections, accreditation inspections last year, um, that the jail was not doing those 14 day screenings um, within that time frame. Um, and I found that out months after that report um, was made and and asked JSO about this and what they were doing to fix the problem. And one of the things they did say is we are talking to Armour about their staffing levels. Um, that's about as far as that conversation got. And we're going to go to the phones again. We've got Wells on the south side. Wells, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, I have a, a question and a comment. Um, my question is, um, Ron Salem, who is now the current president of uh, the city council, um, had a job, or I guess he still has a job as a consultant to the pharmacy. 
uh, part of uh, the uh, jail downtown. And uh, what is his uh, responsibility as a consultant to the pharmacy? And the other question I have or comment is that Dexter Berry, the gentleman who uh, was a heart transplant recipient, shouldn't have been arrested in the first place. Uh, so what is the police uh, accountability in this case? And uh, has uh, uh, TK, what is the sheriff, uh, made any comments regarding um, this uh, event that took place? Thank Th you. Thanks for your question, Charles. Yes, yeah, so um, great question. Um, in regards to Council, um, Councilman Salem, he is subcontracted through Diamond Pharmaceutical, who is subcontracted through Armor. Diamond Pharmaceutical is the company that runs the pharmacy. Um, Salem is um, just somebody who goes in and makes sure that um, medication is not expired, that the fridge is working. Um, basically, just double checks that everything in the pharmacy is working correctly. He has nothing to do with ordering pharmaceuticals. He has nothing to do with um, inmate care. Um, he is just a consultant to make sure that the pharmacy is um, running properly. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you can't tie uh, Ron Salem to the issues that we're seeing with, with people not getting their medication. Those, those are two completely separate things. Um, he did mention about uh, the, uh, the man who, passed away after not getting his uh, anti-rejection medication. Um, do we know, is, is there a lawsuit going on or has there been a lawsuit about that? There is a lawsuit um, that is being formed. It hasn't actually been filed yet, um, but his family does have a civil rights attorney here in Jacksonville who is doing that. And the sheriff's office has opened an internal review about what happened um, to Mr. Barry. I'm not sure if that also includes his arrest or just his time in the jail. Um, I asked Sheriff Waters about that review last week and he said that it is still ongoing. Um, so he wasn't able to comment on it at that time. And we're gonna to go to the phone. Uh, Charlie, in the beaches, how are you today, Charlie? I'm good, my friend. Um, I would like to suggest that when someone goes into the jail, they should be allowed to have a private facilitator, not the jail, but a private facilitator, a person who could oversee their medications as they come into the jail and make sure that they're getting them, the private facilitator, because the person that goes in there may be suffering from depression or mental illness. And so we, we have to depend on the jail to make sure that person is taken care of when that person could have a private facilitator um, that could make sure that the person is being taken care of and there should be a committee our mayor uh, she was a journalist and if she had a committee and you had private individuals that were overseeing their loved ones that were going into the jail and they weren't being taken care of and they weren't being given the medications and again you need a private facilitator a person to oversee that not the jail and then there would be a committee that that committee would go to and that you know you remember with donna deacon when she was a journalist i can promise you that if she found out about that it would be big trouble for the jail thank you charlie thank you so much i think what charlie is advocating for there is basically like a social worker that would work with all the uh the incoming inmates um that's a that's a big task though. That's like that's a whole different that's a whole new division basically that you're creating. Right. Not not saying that we you, that it's impossible. Just saying that like you know you're talking about adding a lot of dollars to the the, the, the column there. Um, and we're going to go to uh, Miriam. Uh, Miriam, how are you this morning? Miriam's not there, so we'll just go to Mark on the west side. Mark, how you doing? Real good. Uh, I was kind of echoing uh, uh, another caller. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I've known lots of friends and associates over the years who have worked for the sheriff's office. And it doesn't seem so much like, you know, big pharma or somebody is trying to prevent the inmates from getting their drugs. It's almost a matter of, of manpower, which, you know, we all know that correctional officers have had a hard time over the years. But, you know, if you're a nurse that works for the jail or works with the jail, you can't see a patient uh, you know, a, a, an inmate without a correctional officer uh, uh, present. And, you know, when they say, you know, days later they're sick or they're hurting or they need to see a doctor, again, it seems like they're almost 
you know, uh, it kind of gets lost in the system. So, yeah, I've had nurse friends of mine say that uh, they've been waiting. They wait hours for a correctional officer to go in with them to see an inmate. And, you know, by that time, the cold or cough or whatever's gotten worse. And uh, so I guess that's part of the problem. Yeah, Mark, thank you so much for your comment. Uh, I, I think what Mark is, is pointing to is uh, not just uh, not having enough staff on the nursing side of things, but also not having enough staff on, uh, from his point of view, not having a, enough staff on the correctional officer side of things. Um, did you get any indication from TK that he was going to be more, uh, that he was going to have his office be more involved in this contract and, and keeping an eye on the new provider? We did ask him during the press conference on Tuesday um, what safeguards are going to be in place to make sure that what happens under NAF care is nothing like what happened under Armour. Um, he just said that there are safeguards under the contract, and I asked him for specific examples, and he declined to answer that. Um, so that's another reason why I am reading through the contract right now. Um, unfortunately, the last three days have been very busy, so I'm on about page 15 out of hundreds. <laughs> In, in in those 15 pages, did anything stick out to you? No, not yet. All right. We're going to go to the phones again. We got Richard on the north side. Richard, how are you doing this morning? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for taking my call. Um, listen, I, I, I'm not certain if anybody has made this connection, but unfortunately, we can see what the crack epidemic did to the black community in the 80s and how it was treated as a criminal and, you know, three strikes and you're out. And then that same epidemic now is, going through the um, sub the suburbs, and it's called the opioid, and we've got even a drug to reverse overdose. Um, we see how the abortion has been unraveled. Um, uh, affirmative action has been unraveled. But no one seems to be making the connection that our current prison system is a system designed around slavery because of the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment makes the prison systems exist. It says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist except as punishment for a crime. Now, that was entered in there because of the way of the mindset that they had about black people and being free. There, there, there just had to be this little clause to be able to um, continue to keep us enslaved. So if we could address the real issue, and that's changing the language, and I don't know if anybody's talking about doing that, and if, if we're all we're doing is talking about how to move prisoners around and treat them while they're in jail, that's just, that's not addressing the real problem. The real problem is legislatively, and the real problem can be addressed by simply removing the exception that says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist, period. And I think once we start having that conversation, then we'll start looking at prisons as more of a rehabilitation process than a punishment. Richard, thank you so much for your comment. And, uh, you know, to en enact something like that, like the 13th Amendment, that's a, a, an act of Congress um, and, and the president, which I uh, totally hear you on that. As far as dealing with, like, the system that we currently have, that like where we are at, uh, I think it behooves uh, the community to keep their eye on what ha what's happening with these contracts and, and the contractors and how they are navigating uh, the work that's ahead of them. Uh, we have a tweet from uh, Fire Pit Mike, and Fire Pit Mike says, why are these folks in jail in the first place? Folks with money can post bond, but folks without money are the ones in jail, correct? Could we eliminate cash bail so that there are fewer people in jail like some states have done? Um, that doesn't really seem to be a, a movement that's really caught on here in, in Florida uh, the way it has in places like in California and certain uh, counties in California. They're, they're moving away from that. Um, have, have, has your reporting showed any of that? No, um, I have not um, been able to. I mean, that's a great question. And yeah. that's a question I would also like to ask, um, but have not been able to do that. We've been very much solely focused on on healthcare in Duval County and um, Armour and now soon NAFCARE. Yeah. And I, I don't want to make light of the, the caller who talked about the 13th Amendment. Like uh, what he read is exactly right. There's actually a documentary on uh, Netflix called the 13th Amendment all about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just saying that like, that is something of uh, that's a national conversation and where we're drilling down to is the local and, and what's and how it shows up uh, in, in in our everyday lives locally. We're going to go to Tom on the west side. Tom, how are you doing this morning? 
Uh, good morning. Yes, along the lines of what you were just suggesting with uh, cash bail, if we uh, embrace civil citations, we would be able to reduce the number of people in jail and there would be less uh, concern with taking care of the jail population because the problem would be much easier. Yeah, Tom, I, 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 I hear you on that. I, I, I wonder if that is something that should be brought up to uh, like the, the city council and to the mayor. Your thoughts? Indeed. Oh, definitely. Uh, Yeah, we need to keep the pressure up to uh, do that because, amongst other things, I mean, Ron Salem wants to uh, move the jail as one of, I mean, to replace the jail as one of his highest priorities. And if we could just reduce the population, that might become unnecessary, which would save the city a lot of money. Tom, thanks so much for calling. We're going to go to Brenda on the south side. Brenda, how are you doing this morning? I'm wonderful. How about yourself? Good. Good. Um, I'm listening to all the callers, and I'm, like, on board with all of that. I love the ideas. But with regards to this medication issue, I just wonder if there's any accountability in the jailing system where when an inmate is brought in before they're even taken to a cell, is their medical condition and medication put in a, a database in their computer system with weekly or i'm sorry let me rephrase daily reports issued for the warden or whoever's monitoring their medical where they can stay on top of this because that seems to be like and i hate to use the word automation but it seems to be the most logical first step in trying to manage this problem yeah what you're what what you're you're pointing to is basically like uh a management system uh, that, uh, you know, a computer uh, a program or whatever that manages their care that, like, you can just check it off and, like, know that it's happening, correct? Is that, am I summing it Absolutely. up correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Something so basic that, so if they're, if they have it, are they using it? It just seems so logical. Yeah. It does. And I I don't know exactly how the system works. Um, We've gotten those records um, regarding Dexter Berry, which does show um, times that he was um, talking with nurses. It does show times that um, he was getting his other medication. So there is some sort of log. Um, I think that brings up something that we actually just reported yesterday. Um, The National Commission on Correctional Health Care, which is a national accrediting agency for jails and prisons, actually in April um, put the jail on probation. They didn't revoke their accreditation. It's just probation. Um, And the jail is still on probation until their next um, review, which is happening later in the year. Um, And so right now we're trying to figure out exactly why it was why that happened, why they're put on probation and see if it is tied to anything re- regarding medications. So will the tributary be following this story? Of course. All right. We got Nicole Manna of the tributary on with us. Thank you so much, Nicole. I really appreciate you coming in and talking to me. Thanks for having me. All right.